If you could get the answer that was correct by asking somebody, why'd you do that? Why do we have those departments? And it also distinguishes between what people think versus what they do. So if you should ever encounter a public opinion poll that says on a scale of one to five, how prepared do you think you are? I'd like you to remember this. Imagine going in for your medical annual checkup and your doctor walks in and hands you a questionnaire. And the first question on, a, on the questionnaire says, how much cancer do you think you have? All I'm suggesting is that's the same thing you get when you ask the public to speculate how prepared do you think you are. You might ask people in St. Louis who know about three things to do to prepare, how prepared they think they are. They've done two and they say very prepared. Or you might ask someone in the Bay Area who knows about 17 things they think they should do. They've only done 12 and they said not prepared very much. So that's the problem with asking for public opinion about this. And recommendations are never made for practice until the findings have been replicated over and over across multiple studies. Now let me give you a summary of the research. Different research exists. Many pieces of research has reached different conclusions. Most of the conclusions that have been reached were based on studies of small local populations. I stand in front of you one of the people who's done those studies. I've done studies on the residents of Koalinga and Taft and Paso Robles and generalized to the nation. You're chuckling, you get the problem with that. What we did was lack clear evidence for what's most versus least important and confidence with which to generalize to everybody else. Here are the things, the research record, if one went into that body of 350 publications, would lead you to conclude. Information entices people to get ready. The more sources, the more channels, the more frequent, telling them what to do versus other things, talking about losses and consequences and consistency across information sources, and you get more public readiness. Second factor, cues. Observing physical and social cues in your environment. Seeing your local government offices shrouded in a tarp with a sign that says, being retrofitted for earthquakes. That's a cue. Statuses, having higher income, having higher education, having higher occupational prestige, all this stuff that social scientists, especially sociologists like. Roles, having a partner, having a family, being responsible for children. Experience, having experienced an earthquake. Believing the information, having it come from a credible source. Knowledge, knowing what to do, knowing where to get more information. Are you bored yet? Wait. Perceived risk, the probability of occurrence, personalizing the information that you get. Perceived actions effectiveness, thinking that taking the action might actually cut your losses. And milling, that is talking it over with other human beings. To make a long story short, we lacked clear knowledge about what was important and fundamentally we lacked clear knowledge about the process whereby information received is converted into public readiness actions. The fundamental basic assumption that you never question when you give information to the public is, does it make a difference? And how does the public who receives it convert that information into action? We didn't know. In other words, we knew what the factors were that people found to correlate with things from time to time in places like Paso Robles and Koalinga and Taft. But we didn't know what mattered most and we didn't know what order things went in. Now we know. the Department of Homeland Security funded me and Linda Bork at UCLA to do the equivalent of the Manhattan Project on public education for hazards. And they said, how much money do you want? We took all we could. 
The findings have produced impeccable evidence. The findings are clear, the findings are consistent, and the findings have been replicated, and their applications ready. That means confident pathways to public readiness are now in hand. This is what the study did. It was on everyone in the United States of America, a statistically representative sample of everyone. And a statistically representative sample of people who live in New York City. And a statistically representative sample of people who live in Washington, D.C. And a statistically representative sample of people who live in Los Angeles. But that's not all. And a statistically representative sample of whites, of Hispanics, of African Americans, of Asian and Pacific Islanders, and people who classify their race or ethnicity as other. I don't know what that means. It doesn't matter. And we took all those factors that prior research told us could predict getting ready in your homes. And we correlated them with taking steps to get ready. That's what a correlation matrix looked like. Now, I don't expect you to be able to see the numbers or interpret them because the factors are listed as X's and the correlations are listed as tiny, itty-bitty little correlation coefficients that are too small for you to read. But what I want to say about this is those correlations are identical to what pollsters find when they correlate gender with getting ready and reach the conclusion that women are more inclined to get ready than men, for example. There it is or that people who have a higher income are more inclined to get ready than people who have a lower income. There's the zero order correlation coefficient. But we did not stop there. What we actually did was modeling. Now let me explain what our goal was. Our goal was to focus in on the key factors and the key processes that lead the public to take readiness actions. Our approach was to start by examining the effect of all the factors that any social or behavioral scientist for any hazard ever found to correlate with public action taking. And to end with a short list of key factors and how they relate to form human process. And we did this, bless our hearts, with money to study terrorism. And we told DHS we needed to study other hazards as well to put that in context. And we constructed models. There's one of the models we used. One of the boxes all the way on the left are demographics. Another one is experience. Another one is cues. Another one is the kind of information that people get. Hypothesizing those factors impact knowledge, what people know, and that those factors all together impact perceived risk, et cetera. And so there were direct and indirect effects. We didn't test the hypothesis. We tested all those hypotheses. Not only did we test those hypotheses, we tested them all simultaneously. And that's what social science looks like. <laughs> that's the model. And if you look on, let's just say, the relationship between X6 or Qs to the last thing on the right, which is preparedness at home, you see a number that says 0.31. What that says is the real relationship between seeing other people getting ready and you getting ready is 0.31 controlling for and eliminating the effects of every other factor in the model. That's reality. We had nothing in the model that we didn't have a basis for putting in, which is the appropriate way to do it, and we had everything in the model that was appropriate to keep in, which is the other side of the same coin. Now, put on your seatbelts. We had breakthrough results. And if you're a social scientist, then I know at least one other person in here, in fact, who got his degree with Lindeborg, 